Um, welcome everybody uh, to this CIS Russian Studies seminar. And I'm really delighted to welcome today our speaker, Dr. Siobhan Hearn. Siobhan Hearn is a historian of gender and sexuality in the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. She was awarded a PhD from the University of Nottingham in 2017, uh, and I particularly appreciative of that because that's where I got my PhD as well. Um, and she completed a Leverhulme Study abor Abroad Fellowship at the University of Latvia in Riga before taking up her current position as a Leverhulme Early Research Career early career fellow at the School of Modern Languages and Cultures at Durham University. Her, her research focuses on the histories of gender and sexuality um, in the Russian Empire and Soviet Union, and is particularly significant for using sexuality as a lens for interrogating the relationship between ordinary people and the Russian um, imperial and Soviet state. Her absolutely fantastic book, um, Policing Prostitution, came out earlier this year with OUP, and it's on the social history of prostitution in, the late, imperi in late imperial Russia that she is going to speak this evening. So I'd like to invite Siobhan to um, start her talk. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the very generous introduction. I'll just get started right away by sharing my screen and get that part over with so everybody can see my presentation. So thank you so much to Sarah for inviting me to talk about my book today. It's really lovely to virtually be in CIS. Um, I'd obviously much rather be in London with everybody, um, but it's great to see everyone virtually and thanks so much for the invitation. So how I'm gonna structure my talk today, I'm gonna begin by outlining what the regulation of prostitution was in the Russian empire. This is the topic of my book. Before moving on to outline my approach to the history of prostitution. And then I'm gonna very briefly go through some of the findings of my book chapter by chapter. So let's get started right away with the regulation of prostitution. So from 1843 until after the empire's collapse in 1917, the Tsarist authorities conducted the medical police supervision of prostitution, which was known more commonly um, as supervision, not Zord in Russian. The Imperial Ministry of Internal Affairs implemented this system across the empire with the stated aims of safeguarding public health and morality. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries, urban centers with adequate financial resources began to implement this system of regulation, either by establishing so-called medical police committees, which were the organizations charged with overseeing the registration of women as prostitutes, their medical examination, and the issuance of brothel licenses, or by instructing the local police within these urban settlements to perform these roles. Now, the regulation of prostitution in the Russian Empire was organized in a very similar manner to other international systems of regulation that were in operation across the European continent in the 19th and 20th centuries. In order to work legally, women who were selling sex were required to follow a long list of rules decided by their local police and approved by the central government. They were required to register their details with their local police, for example, and attend biweekly gynecological examinations. Once registered, women swapped their internal passports, which was this really important document for securing employment or for migrating, for a medical ticket. Now you can see one on the slide here. This is from the National Archives of Estonia, um, a woman called Annette Bart. She was registered as a prostitute in the city of Narva in 1903. And you can see that she's received the stamp of healthy on her medical ticket for various different examinations performed in that year. So once women had made this swap from the internal passport to the medical ticket, this became the main form of identification, and the results of each medical examination that they were supposed to have were meant to be stamped on the inlay of the medical ticket. As well as this, women had to abide by a whole host of other restrictions on their movements, visibility and behaviour. Under the system of regulation as well, brothel keepers were required to apply for licences in order to legally open their establishments, and they also had to abide by a whole host of rules intent on keeping prostitution hidden within urban space. Now, the rules of regulation targeted women who sold sex and brothel keepers, but this regulation system actually had a far reaching impact on various other groups within lower class late imperial society. Brothel madams, for example, really bickered with urban residents over the visibility and audibility of prostitution within urban space. Police agents who were in charge of implementing these rules forged advantageous financial relationships with registered prostitutes and their managers. 
And the Russian government in the early 20th century became more concerned with combating rising levels of venereal diseases amongst the population. And this meant that the movement and bodies of certain groups of lower class men became objects of state intervention. Now, the scope of this regulation system significantly expanded in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The number of women working as registered prostitutes expanded rapidly in tandem with accelerated industrial urban um, and industrial development. So just to give you a handful of examples, there were two prostitution surveys conducted in the Russian Empire, one in 1889 and one in 1909. And in these two surveys, the number of women registered as prostitutes in the province of Estland, the province that now comprises northern Estonia, doubled. And in Minsk province, the number of registered prostitutes increased by over 275%. As the empire's railway network expanded and urban populations exploded in size, regulation was implemented for the very first time in certain provincial towns and cities, particularly the towns and cities that ran along the Trans-Siberian Railway. By the early 20th century, regulation had been introduced in various urban centres across the empire, from Warsaw to Vladivostok, from Yerevan to Arkhangelsk. Now, my book focuses on the regulation of prostitution in the late Russian Empire and asks three central questions, which I've listed on the slide. So number one, how was regulation experienced and resisted by those who interacted with the system? Number two, how did the system actually function in practice? And finally, how did it vary from place to place? Now, in exploring this first question, Mark provides the history of prostitution in the final decades of the Russian Empire. I'm particularly interested in moving away from the perspectives of educated elites or medical experts to examine regulation from the perspectives of those working, using, and encountering the commercial sex industry on a regular basis. Each chapter of the book focuses on a different group that interacted with the regulation system. So it begins by looking at women who sold sex before moving on to examine men who paid for it, brothel madams, the police, and wider urban communities. Now, as you can see from the title of my book, my primary research subjects are the empire's so-called lower classes. Now, I use this umbrella term to generally refer to individuals from the non-privileged classes who would have been defined as peasants, or townspeople under the empire's social estate system. Although lower class may appear quite archaic, maybe at first glance, I feel like it usefully breaks down these simplistic and inadequate categories of peasant and worker and reflects the fluctuation and ambiguity of social identities in the late imperial period. I use this term as really influenced by the work of historians like Martha Steinberg and Stephen Frank, who really beautifully illustrated how Social boundaries, mentalities, and identities were violated and negotiated on the civic stage in the late imperial period, amongst this period of sort of rapid um, urbanization and industrialization. Also, regulation was a system primarily for and overwhelmingly staffed by people who hailed from the lower classes. The vast majority of registered prostitutes were either peasants or townswomen, and brothel madams largely came from the same demographic background. Registered prostitutes' clients came from across the social spectrum, but there was a real prevalence of cheaper second and third class brothels in major cities, which suggests that registered prostitutes predominantly served lower class customers. Medical police patrolmen were so poorly paid that we can assume that their role was primarily carried out by lower class men. My book also offers a fresh perspective on histories of prostitution, as it draws extensively on letters written by registered prostitutes, their clients, brothel madams, and urban residents to the Tsarist authorities. The Russian Empire actually makes a really interesting setting for studying the history of prostitution because of this deep-rooted and long-standing tradition of public supplication that stretches way back to the early imperial period. In the late imperial period, Writing and submitting a petition to the authorities was an effective method for airing grievances or requesting some form of state intervention. Using petitions to examine how regulation was experienced and resisted allows us to move beyond the perspectives of the elite observers and explore the various creative and often very humorous rhetorical strategies employed by lower class people in order to achieve specific ends and also the multiple ways in which they sought engagement and interaction with the Russian imperial state. Petitions written to the authorities by registered prostitutes, their managers, their clients, and wider urban communities also reveals the diversity of interactions with and reactions to this system of the regulation of prostitution. Urban residents' reactions to state-licensed brothels range from repulsion to indifference, 
Some madams had close ties with law enforcement, which granted them flexibility over the running of their establishments. And then others wrote in protest against their victimization at the hands of medical police police agents who were often able to manipulate the rules of regulation for their own benefit. Petitions, I think most importantly, also illuminate the multiple sophisticated ways in which lower class people communicated with those in authority. As they drew on official discourses about the immorality of prostitution, the efficacy of regulation, and the need to segregate women who sold sex from the wider public in order to achieve specific ends. Now, as I mentioned earlier, my second core concern relates to how regulation functioned in practice. In short, regulation was much messier in practice than the central government cared to admit. In my book, I argue that regulation was not this state policy enforced from the top down onto a compliant population. And registered women were certainly not just objects of state policy who passively accepted the rules of regulation. Instead, many sought to negotiate the rules to achieve their own ends in specific ways. For example, some registered prostitutes wrote to the authorities threatening to work illegally if their demands were not met, and others went on strike for better working conditions during the 1905 revolutions. Local authorities were also financially dependent on the dues and bribes that brothel keepers and registered prostitutes paid, which allowed those in the business of commercial sex to subvert official attempts at spatial segregation. The imperial authorities also overstated how far registered prostitutes were excluded from wider so-called respectable urban communities. Landlords and landladies often refused to abide by the regulations intent on keeping prostitutes segregated within urban space, perhaps motivated again by their own financial gain. The empire's chronically understaffed police force just did not have the men, resources, or even the desire to implement the strict rules of regulation. Police patrolmen likely regularly paid for sex themselves, or at the very least were heavily dependent on the bribes from registered prostitutes and brothel madams in order to supplement their own low wages. The imperial authorities relied very heavily on ordinary people to implement their ambitious policies, but all the evidence that I've found suggests that ordinary people were just not as invested in the professed medical and moral benefits of regulation as official had hoped. In short, there was a huge gulf between state ambitions and reality, which is a well-explored theme in the context of Russian imperial history. Now, finally, in tackling the last question on the slide, my book explores the significant variation in the application of regulation from place to place across the empire. I think that looking beyond the metropole is essential in order to understand the application of empire-wide policy, and I feel it's especially important with regards to the history of prostitution. The, institu sorry, the institutional structures within the empire were molded by the individuals who were in charge of their operation. And these men enjoyed significant latitude in the formulation and implementation of policy. Provincial administrators and local police were in charge of funding and implementing regulation. So the extent to which the rules were applied very much depended on local priorities, as well as the social, economic, and even environmental characteristics of a particular place. To examine this significant variation, my study focuses on the provinces of the empire that now comprise Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and the urban centers and the surrounding provinces of the city of Kangalsk, Moscow, Minsk, and St. Petersburg. Focusing on this Northwest and predominantly the Baltic region helps to shift the history of sexuality in the Russian imperial context away from the imperial center. I think this is quite important because capital cities are often anomalies in the history of sexuality. They're home to the most varied entertainment venues, the most ethnically diverse populations, and the most developed police and apparatuses, which means that they often offer specific opportunities for sexual expression and regulation that just often don't exist in smaller towns and cities. Therefore, examining prostitution in the various Airbnb peripheries of the empire reveals how approaches to police and prostitution, as well as the relationship between the Russian imperial state and its subjects, hinged upon the social, economic, and environmental characteristics of this particular place, as well as the priorities of provincial governments. Now, in my book, as I mentioned, I draw extensively on archival material, oh, just gonna change the slide, from the provinces of Estland, Lifland, and Kurland. These were collectively known as the Baltic provinces, and this region now comprises the independent countries of Estonia and Latvia. Now, for those unfamiliar with this Baltic region and the Russian Empire, it was a multi-ethnic territory that occupied a really unique space on the imperial landscape as it was gradually incorporated into the Russian Empire over the course of the 18th century. 
There are various factors behind me choosing mainly to focus on these provinces, but I'll mention maybe the two most important ones here. First of all, literacy was far higher in the Baltic provinces than other regions of the empire, thanks to the region's strong ties with Lutheranism and the tradition of rural school networks that stretched way back into the 18th century. The first ever empire-wide census of 1897 indicated that 96% of Estonians, 92% of Latvians had at least partial literacy, compared to this empire-wide average of around 21%. This great illiteracy is illustrated by the sheer volume of correspondence between lower class inhabitants of the Baltic provinces and the Russian imperial authorities, as there are thousands and thousands of letters preserved in the National Archives of Estonia and the Latvian State Historical Archives. Okay, so now I've outlined my approach, I'm going to move on to discuss the state regulation system from the perspectives of those working in, using or encountering the commercial sex industry on a regular basis. And I'm going to begin by talking about women who sold sex. So the first chapter of my book explores the lives and challenges of women who sold sex in the late Russian Empire by looking at the various different ways in which registered prostitutes define themselves and how they were defined by those in authority. In this period, some registered prostitutes were women who sold sex, oh, sorry, some women who sold sex were urban workers who fought for their rights to be upheld and called out the illegal application of regulation policy. To give just one of many examples, in 1908, six dream registered prostitutes penned a furious letter to the police chief of the city of Brest, which is now located in Western Belarus. And these women were right into the police chief of the city to protest against the decision that he had made to force them to work in brothels rather than out of their apartments as they had been doing for the past few years. Under the regulation system, women could choose to work at brothels or at other locations like out of their apartments, in restaurants, taverns, and so on. And this latter group were known as Adinachki. In their letter, the women reminded the police chief that his actions were, and I'm quoting from them here, illegal in relation to fundamental laws, and they used their knowledge of the system imposed upon them to further their own aims. The women also exploited stereotypes about prostitutes and included a series of veiled threats, telling the police chief that he didn't, if he didn't allow them to work where they wanted, they would deliberately spread syphilis around the city and garrison. Other women who sold sex were migrant seasonal workers who engaged in prostitution for a few months or weeks at a time before moving on to another place or to another job. In some regions of the empire, the authorities accepted seasonal prostitution as just another part of the regional economy. For example, in the city of Arkhangelsk near the Arctic Circle, the police allowed women on the police list to deregister en masse when the port froze over each autumn and when the commercial activity of the city declined. And this is a period in Arkhangelsk where many seasonal workers traveled to the interior provinces in search of work. These same women who left the police lists en masse in the autumn as the port froze over would then re-register the following spring. Labor migration was especially important in Arkhangelsk province because of the region's low soil fertility and relatively short seasons of sowing and harvesting. And it appears that this colored approaches to policing prostitution in this region. Now, finally, not all women who registered as prostitutes did so willingly. The Imperial police often conflated promiscuous behavior with prostitution and forced women to register as prostitutes against their will. Forced registration was particularly common in Riga in the early 1900s, as policemen patrolled parks, taverns, and hotels, looking for women suspected to be engaged in extramarital sex confiscating their internal passports and then registering them on the police list of prostitutes. Arguably, this practice of forced registration can be regarded as an official attempt to kick back against the increasing individualization and anonymity of urban life, as well as the perceived disruption of the patriarchal gender order and widespread moral decline brought about by mass rural to urban migration and urbanization. Whatever the police's aim, women did not passively accept forced registration and wrote furious letters to the police demanding their deregistration and the return of their internal passports. Hundreds of these letters are preserved in the Latvian State Historical Archives, for example, and they reveal the various sophisticated rhetorical techniques employed by lower caste people to propel the authorities into action, including appropriating state discourses that drew a binary between so-called honest women on the one hand and debauched prostitutes on the other. So now let's look at another group that regularly interacted with the regulation system, and this is men who paid for sex. 
the Russian imperial state devised the regulation of prostitution as kind of like an outlet for male heterosexual desire. The authorities were largely disinterested in the behavior and bodies of the majority of men who paid for sex. The rules classified registered prostitutes' bodies as the chief site of venereal disease control, and the examination of clients was never legally mandated on an empire-wide basis. Because of this, it's really difficult to establish a social profile of the typical client, but we can deduce from other information that they predominantly hailed from the lower classes. Urban centers were male arenas in the late imperial period. Meager wages and the rise in cost of living in cities meant that many male rural to urban migrants left their wives or partners behind in the countryside, which created a thrive in demand for the commercial sex industry in urban centers. Across the empire, city authorities ranked brothels in a three-rung hierarchy, and their classification dictated their opening hours, their price per visit, and the amount of tax due to the police. The majority of state licensed brothels were categorized as second or third class. So, for example, in St. Petersburg at the turn of the 20th century, almost three quarters of brothels were second or third class. And in the city of Riga, two thirds were second and third class too. Even if it's difficult to survey clients in general, the Russian Empire's long standing tradition of public supplication made men who paid for sex visible both to the state and to the historian. In attempting to organize the registration and examination of all women thought to be selling sex, the imperial state established itself as a service provider. And when clients were dissatisfied with the service, they lodged written complaints to their local authorities. Other men chose to write to the Tsarist authorities to expose so-called clandestine prostitutes, which was a term used for women believed to be selling sex without registering with the police and attending their mandatory medical examinations. When denouncing so-called clandestine prostitutes, clients positioned themselves as enactors of patriarchal authority on the ground and emphasized the vital service that they provided to the authorities. They drew on medical and popular anxieties regarding the impact of venereal diseases on public health, as well as official discourses advocating social control to prevent the spread of infection. Let's take a look at a typical letter sent from a male client to the Tsarist authorities. In April 1909, an anonymous petitioner sent a letter to the St. Petersburg police, accusing a woman known as Lipa of secretly working as a prostitute. Lipa allegedly solicited men on Nevsky Prospect in the evenings and could be found in the Café de Paris in the basement of the Passage shopping arcade, which was a real nexus of legal and clandestine prostitution in popular imagination. And this guy's letter read, after spending one night with her during Holy Week, on the second day, I became ill and the doctor confirmed that I had cancroid. This is a really, really horrible venereal disease. Please don't Google it. I most humbly beg you to prevent this person from spreading her infection amongst the city's inhabitants and bring her under medical examination. This man signed his letter as the victim, positioning himself as passive in relation to the woman that he paid for sex. He also admitted to paying for sex during Holy Week, appeared in the orthodox calendar where sexual intercourse should technically be avoided, but conversely when demand for commercial sex expanded considerably. In his employment of deferential language, he framed himself as passive in relation to the authorities too, by begging the state to act on his behalf. By humbly begging the authorities for assistance, the petitioner helped to reinforce the inherent paternalism of the Tsarist state. This petitioner's role playing of the deferential individual seeking state assistance demonstrates how subjects of the empire availed themselves as au of autocratic ideology to achieve their own ends. I found plenty of letters where petitioners employed similar rhetorical techniques in various archives too. After examining these kind of written interactions between men who paid for sex and the authorities, chapter two moves on to look at specific groups of men who the Russian imperial state was actually very interested in monitoring, such as military personnel. Unlike urban civilian clients, the Tsarist authorities cared really deeply about the sexual health of men in the military for a variety of reasons. First of all, the fate of the empire in the event of enemy attack was dependent on healthy and virile soldiers and sailors. Secondly, incidents of syphilis and gonorrhea and cancroid were four times higher for military personnel compared with the civilian population. Also, as in other international contexts, the Russian imperial military was often used as a test site for the experimentation and implementation of new medical technologies. And this is because military personnel were a highly controlled and monitored population, 
and also because the war ministry was more of a financial priority for the Russian imperial government than other bureaucratic agencies. Throughout the late 19th and early 20th century, military officials experimented with compulsory corporal examinations for soldiers and sailors, contraceptives, and prophylactic treatments to deal with rise in levels of VD in the military, which they found particularly alarming. So now let's look at those who managed sex in the Russian Empire. These were mainly brothel madams, pimps, and those who rented their properties to registered prostitutes. For the sake of brevity here, I'm just going to focus on brothel madams. Madams mediated between the police and those registered on the police lists, gluing the regulation system together by providing this vital link between registered prostitutes and the czarist authorities. Brothel madams were essential for the functioning of the regulation system, but they were also easily disposable. They possessed relative power and wealth in the relation to the women that they employed, but their businesses existed almost entirely at the discretion of state officials who held complete power over them. Women also dominated the business of prostitution. Although the authorities did not care about the gender of other managers of commercial sex, such as landlords who rented to registered prostitutes and hotel owners who let their rooms for commercial sex, only women were allowed to legally be brothel keepers. Madame's also had substantial responsibilities to both the public and the women that they employed. Empire-wide instructions for police and prostitution demanded that madames follow a list of 33 regulations compared with just 11 for registered prostitutes. These rules prescribe various roles to brothel madams, such as guardians of public health, watchdogs, and money makers for the local government. Like other imperial subjects communicating with the czarist authorities, madams replicated state discourses in order to achieve specific ends. For example, prospective madame Maria Lessenberg did so when she petitioned her local authorities for permission to open a brothel in Vero, which is now in Estonia, in 1914. She began her letter, which I quote from here, currently there is not a single brothel in Vero, which is very harmful for residents, for the health of the residents of the town. Lessenberg evidenced her claim by referencing the dramatic increase in levels of venereal disease since the city's brothels were closed down, tapping into official anxieties regarding the dangers of clandestine prostitution. Here she drew on the state's language about the health benefits of regulating prostitution and positioned herself as a solution for Vero's public health problem. In this chapter on managing commercial sex, I also look at the relationship between these managers and other groups, such as registered prostitutes and the police. The rules of regulation gave ample room for brothel madams to exploit their employees, as they were legally allowed to keep up to three quarters of their wages. There are countless police reports of the financial exploitation and physical abuse of brothel workers by their madams. But most of the time, the police sided with the madame in these kind of disputes. This is likely because of the close relationship between the police and brothel madams, who worked in a partnership to reinforce the rules of regulation through checking the documents of registered prostitutes. Managers of commercial sex also provided municipal governments with a steady flow of cash through paying taxes. As well as providing this sort of income through official channels, Rotha Madame supplemented the low wages of medical police patrolmen who think, through paying regular bribes. Bribes allowed brothel madams to circumvent regulations and often ensure that their establishments remained open despite repeated protests from urban communities. Madame's relative wealth, their supervisory role, and their close ties to law enforcement gave them an elevated status among labor and marginal elements of society, which bred resentment and contributed to their negative portrayals in print media. As the face of regulation, they were often attacked as emblematic of wider problems with the regulation system. I'm sure many people are familiar with the various madams in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, Falso's Resurrection, or Kuprin's The Pit, but this is just one part of the story. Some brothel keepers really did see themselves as fair employers offering opportunities for work. Madams could also be vulnerable members of urban communities, and they faced a whole host of personal and professional challenges. Brothel madams helped the imperial state enforce regulation, but their establishments enjoyed no promise of security and were entirely dependent on officials who could revoke their licenses for any number of reasons. Or they were very dependent on police patrolmen who could force the closure of their businesses if they did not pay a bribe. As in the rest of this book, this chapter weaves a complicated and varied picture 
to provide a social history of brothel keeping that moves beyond the stereotypes that we're also familiar with from literature and other print media. It's impossible to examine this regulation system without considering the role of the state, especially the individuals who are in charge of policing prostitution. And here I mean provincial governments, municipal authorities, and medical police committees. As I mentioned earlier, the severity with, with, with which regulation was applied varied really widely from place to place and was often really dependent on the social, economic, and environmental characteristics of the location in question. This was in fact a feature of Russian imperial governments more generally, which was characterized by the constant adaption of governance to fit the characteristics of a particular place. Government officials in the capital were largely uninterested in how the police and the prostitution functioned at a local level across the empire. And the Ministry of Internal Affairs expected local authorities to establish their own specific policing practices and raise the funds for regulation themselves. Because of this, medical police committees were chronically understaffed and staff were paid very little, which left ample room for corruption. Overall, there was this huge gulf between what the state envisaged for the regulation of prostitution and how it actually functions on the ground. Thousands of women sold sex without registering with the police, registered women routinely followed the rules, and the separation of registered prostitutes from the general public that was deemed so important in the rules of regulation just didn't happen in practice. Regulation also failed to meet its medical objectives, as venereal diseases were extremely common illnesses in the decades before 1917. The relationship between registered prostitutes and the police was also really complicated, as often the lives of police and police were closely and sometimes even intimately entwined. Police patrolmen sometimes exhorted and abused registered prostitutes, whereas others collected bribes and turned a blind eye when registered women broke the rules. In St. Petersburg, most low-ranking policemen were young, unmarried men living in barracks, and high incidence of venereal diseases suggests that many paid for sex. In Minsk, certain policemen who ended up on the city's hospital for venereal disease treatment admitted to catching their infection from one of the city's registered prostitutes. The relationship between the two groups could sometimes be rather informal. For example, in Riga, registered prostitutes wrote short messages to the police in Latvian, German, and Russian, admitting that they were going to miss their medical examinations or simply that they were removing themselves from the police lists. And these were both activities that violated the rules of regulation and for which a woman could be punished. So on the slide on the right hand side, you can see a tourist style postcard of Riga's Bastion Hill sent to the Riga police in November 1912 by a woman with the surname Bruchman, removing herself from the police lists. You can't quite read the um, the cursive, but it says, do not look for me because I've left Riga, and then she signs her name. In another letter from August 1912, a woman traveled 150 kilometers east from Riga to Goldingen, which is now called Riga in Latvia, to stay for a few months. In the October, she wrote a letter to the committee explaining her absence and lack of contact. And I'll read from a letter here. Sorry that I did not tell you where I'm living earlier, but I couldn't find anyone to write in Russian, so I've had to write myself. Sorry, the writing is so bad, but I only know German and Estonian. I went to the doctor in Riga on the 10th of August and went to Goldingen on the 12th of August. It was a Sunday, so I did not write to you as I thought the committee would be closed. Overall, the limited resources and the police's inability or unwillingness to enforce policy meant that regulation consistently failed to meet its desired medical and moral objectives. And women, and in the case of Riga, were very comfortable in flouting the rules and telling the police that they were going to be doing so. Now, if the regulation system was chronically understaffed, underfunded, and ineffective during peacetime, war greatly exacerbated the situation. In my period of study, there were two major conflicts. So first, the Russo-Japanese War, 1904 to 1905, and then the First World War. The Russo-Japanese War was a disaster for the Russian imperial state, resulting in significant losses of human life, huge territorial losses, and billions upon billions of rubles of debt. The mass mobilization of men from the Western provinces to the East increased the visibility of prostitution along the Trans-Siberian Railway, but the central government refused to provide any additional funding to assist local municipal authorities in implementing regulation in various town cities and railway junctions in Siberia, like Orenburg, Chita, Chelyabinsk, Krasnoyarsk, and Irkutsk. Hospitals were, were stretched beyond full capacity in these regions, which meant that the inspection and treatment of registered prostitutes became less of a priority. 
During the First World War, amid the social and economic chaos and colossal population displacement, the Tsarist government and military authorities struggled to control the movement of women who sold sex. Countless police reports bemoaned registered prostitutes who entered restricted military zones like barracks, disguised as military nurses. Certain municipal authorities in the Baltic region attempted to expel registered prostitutes from their authorities, perhaps with the aim of um, preventing the spread of venereal diseases in the context of wartime. For example, the Baltic provinces of Estland and Livland were very important sites of industrial production, and they were strategically significant as they were home to the major port of Riga and the smaller port of Tallinn, which was then known as Brudevel. After the German invasion of nearby Kurland and Vilna provinces in 1915, the protection of this northern Baltic region became ever more important. In October 1915, Riga's chief of police issued an order expelling 296 registered prostitutes from the city. The overwhelming majority of these women who were expelled hailed from the Baltic provinces and had Germanic surnames, which indicates that the deportations may be perhaps um, more general anti-German wartime sentiments, um, but it's, it's obviously difficult to tell. In winter 1915, the chief of police in the city of Yorev, now Tartu, expelled all registered prostitutes from the city. Despite this, the orders were largely ineffective as the authorities in these cities did not have the facilities to enforce the permanent expulsion of hundreds of registered prostitutes. In both cities, the police complained that these two orders had been completely ineffective just a few months after they'd been issued, again reflecting this broader gulf between state goals and the realities in the context of wartime. Now, finally, let's shift focus on examining what it meant to live in towns and cities in the late imperial period when prostitution was a visible component of urban life. One of the most contentious and frequently discussed aspects of the commercial sex industry was the brothel. There was no single type of brothel in the late Russian Empire, and rather were two principal legal variations of brothels. So houses of toleration on the one hand, which were um, managed by brothel madams, or houses of assignation, which were more informal locations in which registered prostitutes could rent rooms to meet with their clients on an hourly or nightly basis. As well as these two legal variations, there were thousands of informal and unregistered sites of prostitution that operated without obtaining licenses from the municipal authorities. So, for example, bathhouses, restaurants, tea houses, taverns, and so on. Depending on the perspective of landlords and tenants, brothels could be an irritating source of visual and oral pollution, a potent source of moral contamination, a threat to the traditional family order, or just another ordinary apartment indistinguishable from the rest. Landlords regarded brothels as everything from tenant repellents on the one hand to valuable and reliable sources of rental income on the other. Brothels therefore are central to the urban history of the Russian Empire and looking at the various ways in which urban residents reacted to them reveals the contrast and moral geographies of late imperial urban environments. Now moral geographies refer to assumptions about what behaviours belong in which particular places based on the classification of a place as central, peripheral, public or private. For example, prostitution may be deemed acceptable within the walls of a brothel, but when it became visible on the street level, i.e. through an open window, it might have the potential to generate moral panic. Economic interests and the competing moral geographies of the authorities and urban residents collided in the empire's expanding urban centres as the space of the city was constructed and reconstructed amid rapid urbanisation at the turn of the 20th century. The police supervision of state licensed brothels was also part of wider attempts by the imperial authorities to intervene into the leisure activities and spaces inhabited by lower class people. As although high cross brothels were plenty of feature in Russian cities, the vast majority of state licensed establishments catered to lower class clientele. In addition to brothels, the Tsarist authorities endeavoured to regulate the activities occurring within urban bathhouses, cinemas, restaurants, theatres, taverns and tea houses. These interventions were largely driven by paternalistic ideas about the need to protect the naive and easily led lower classes from the vices of the modern city. The ideal brothel contained all evidence of commercial sex to prevent the moral decline of the wider urban population. Anything that encouraged rowdy behavior, such as the sale of alcohol, the playing of loud music, card games, dice or checkers were forbidden, as was the hanging of paintings that so-called depicted passion 
as well as images of the imperial family. Brothels were supposed to be located at least 320 meters from churches, synagogues, and other educational institutions. Windows that faced on the street were to be covered with curtains in the daytime and with shutters in the nighttime. However, just as attempt to regulate behavior in other lower class spaces were far less totalized and in practice than reality. So too was this ideal of the quiet brothel that concealed all evidence of prostitution, little more than a mirage. As well as attempting to keep prostitution contained within the walls of the brothel, city authorities also endeavored to concentrate prostitution within specific districts of towns and cities. The provincial and devolved nature of Russian imperial power meant that the municipal authorities had the final say on brothel locations, as prospective madams had to apply for a license before legally opening their establishments. The police and medical police committee were also able to rank brothels into this three-rung hierarchy that I mentioned, based on the amount of tax that they paid to the authorities. Paying higher taxes allowed brothel madams to keep their establishments open for longer and charge higher prices for sexual intercourse, which then dictated the social composition of their clientele. Through licenses and the ranking system, the imperial authorities attempted to sketch the moral geography of the city, demarcating exactly where the impact of visible commercial sex would be potentially detrimental for the population and where it would be of little consequence. However, attempt is definitely the operative word when discussing these zoning practices of the imperial state. In the early days of state regulation, brothels had originally been confined to the outskirts of towns and cities, but rapid urbanization and the expansion of urban centers meant that these establishments came to be located within residential districts and even in town and city centers. Thousands and thousands of landlords and residents petitioned the Ministry of Internal Affairs, asking for nearby brothels to be closed down or relocated. In their letters, they referenced the need to protect lower class people from moral corruption that was caused by visible prostitution, echoing the state stereotypes about the susceptibility and naivety of the empire's lower classes. Despite other rhetorical flourish, they were often ignored because, as I mentioned earlier, brothel madams provided the police with valuable income. Because of this, brothels were everywhere in larger cities rather than just confined to specific state approved locations. So brothels really were a visible incursion for many urban residents, but again, that's not the whole story. On certain streets and in certain cities, residents and landlords accepted their existence without protest. Take, for example, the following case from Tallinn. In 1909, a man called Simon Katz petitioned the authorities to request permission to be able to build a wooden two-story building um, to house a brothel on number eight Martinskaya Street. Another step in this process was obtaining the consent of neighboring landlords, and luckily for Katz, the owners of various houses on the street sent letters of approval to the city police chief, and construction went ahead two months after the initial request. On this street in Tallinn, landlords did not subscribe to the ideas that brothels had a negative impact on rental prices, and perhaps saw the financial benefit of renting to brothel madams, who likely had a regular stream of income. In addition to this case, there are countless other examples of financial concerns eclipsing moral judgment, judgments in the business of commercial sex in other urban centres. For example, the rules of regulation dictated exactly where registered prostitutes were able to live in a given town or city, and this usually excluded main avenues, squares or streets adjacent to palaces, educational institutions or barracks. However, I found hundreds of examples of landlords in Riga, Minsk, St. Petersburg and Vilnius helping registered prostitutes resist this official spatial segregation by just renting to them and ignoring the rules, much to the irritation of the local police. Again, this evidence illustrates the complexity of reactions to commercial sex in this period. Some landlords and urban residents resented registered prostitutes' visible presence in urban centres, whereas others saw them as just another group of neighbours or tenants. Now, I think I've talked for long enough, so I'm just going to draw to some very brief um, concluding points. Overall, by looking at prostitution from the social history perspective, we can see that reactions to the regulation of prostitution were complicated and multifaceted. Regional case studies illuminate the fact that the application of regulation varied very widely from place to place, so we're not able to generalize about a vast empire based solely on material from the capital city. Finally, by looking closely at how the regulation functioned in practice, it allows us to explore this perennial theme from Russian imperial and indeed Soviet history, which is this chasm between what the state envisaged on the one hand and the reality at the street level on the other. 
Thank you very much for your attention.